Let's start with looking at a very simple situation, like the one that is sketched here. This is the listener with a left ear and a right ear. The listener is looking straight and the listener is exposed to the sound field of one sound source, which is indicated with a loudspeaker symbol. And if the sound source is not located inside the median plane, which is this one, then there will be some uh, path length difference from the sound source to the ears. So in this case, the path that the sound has to travel to the right ear of the user is shorter than the path that the sound has to travel to the left ear. And this causes a timing difference. Um, because the speed of sound is finite, it is in the order of 300 meters per se uh, 340 meters per second, or equivalently um, 30, 30 something centimeters per millisecond. This causes this difference in path length causes a timing difference, and our our auditory system is able to sense this. It is able to measure um, uh, to sense that there is a timing difference, and also it is able to measure how much of a timing difference is there. And this, the differences that arise are in the order of maximally a couple hundred microseconds. So it's very short um, differences. But our auditory system is able to sense this, and this is how it knows that the sound source was located lateral, if it was that. Similarly, in the same uh, situation, the head will also occlude the sound that reaches the contralateral ear, which would be the left one in this case. The ear that in, this is directly illuminated by the sound source is called ipsilateral. So the head is basically in the way so that it will attenuate the sound field that reaches the contralateral ear. It will primarily do this for higher frequencies, um, but still it will do this when then speaks of an interaural level difference. So these two uh, cues, the interaural time difference, ITD, and the interaural level difference, ILD, are the major cues for lateralization. And um, in static scenarios, if you allow changes of the head orientation, then the dynamic changes of these interaural difference, of the time and the level difference, they are also very strong cues for localization. For example, for differentiating front and rear. Imagine a sound source is in front of me and I turn my head to the left, then this ear, the signal at this ear will be leading over the other one. Whereas if the sound source is behind me and I turn my head to the left, then it will be the other ear that will be leading. And this is a very strong cue that allows our auditory system to differentiate whether a sound source was in front or behind um, the listener. Similarly, a sound source uh, above or uh, straight below, the listener will not cause any changes in interaural differences when rotating the head about the vertical axis. This is one means how we can uh, localize sound sources above and below us. <coughs> um, additional to these interaural differences are the so-called monaural cues. If you look at the uh, shape of the outer ear, so the outer ear includes everything that you see, including the shape of the head and the shoulders, and all these parts of the body will have an influence on the signal that reaches the uh, eardrum of a listener. And the influence of this signal is dependent on the angle of incidence, on the direction of incidence. You can imagine a sound source, that a sound signal that arrives from the front will be guided differently into the ear canal compared to a sound from above, for example, because our ears are not symmetric. So the changes, the effect of the pinna, the outer ear, will be different depending on the angle. Similarly, a sound source that impinges from the rear will be guided differently into the ear canal compared to, sound, uh, compared to, sound, to a sound signal from the front. This, is, um, this causes um, subtle but still detectable spectral differences, which our auditory system also recognizes. And this is another way how we can differentiate front and rear. But these cures are not as strong, or they are not as reliable as, these, uh, as the interaural differences and also the dynamic changes of the interaural differences. How uh, or the the fact that these uh, the acoustic influence of the body on the signal that arrives at the ears um, um, is systematic, and this fact is illustrated um, in this chart on a horizontal axis. You see the frequency. Um, uh, the range is four kilohertz to twenty kilohertz. So we're lo looking at the higher part of the audible frequency range, and the vertical axis shows the magnitude of the transfer function from a sound source location to the ear um, of the, to the ear canal entrance of the listener and all the and this is plotted for different um, 
positions of the sound source and each position is offset slightly so that the graphs don't overlap and we can eat them, uh, re read them easier. So the positions we're looking at, so the lowest graph is uh, the, trans the magnitude of the transfer path from, the, from a sound source in front of the listener to the ear. And then as we're moving up on the plot, the, uh, also the sound source moves up and the top uh, graph will show the transfer path um, from a sound source straight uh, uh, above the listener. So if, you're t if, so if we're changing the elevation of that sound source, we can, so first of all, what we see is that this transfer curve is not flat. So different, some frequencies are boosted and other frequencies are attenuated. This is because of the interference um, that is uh, taking place um, in the outer ear. So if you're looking, for example, at this dip, we have this dip of a couple of 10-ish ten, decibels, around 8 kilohertz. If the elevation of the sound source increases, then this dip moves down in frequency slightly. Similarly, this dip moves down in frequency also fairly strongly um, with changing elevation. And uh, if, this, if for certain elevations, there's even uh, another dip that did not exist before for other elevations. So there's a lot of systematic differences that occur as a function of the source angle. And our auditory system has learned this and it is aware of what um, spectral transfer, what, what transfer path belongs to what sound source location, so that this is this, so that it can recognize um, uh, if a sound source is elevated. It can recognize all the interferences and all the acoustic influence of the outer ear on the signal that reaches the eardrum. And of course, so these are so-called monaural cues, and they are evaluated. Uh, additionally to the interval timing and level differences <coughs> excuse me so um, all the cues they are evaluated at any uh, moment in time and the the whole of the acoustic cues that a signal has as it reaches the eardrums is called head related transfer function or HRTF that incorporates so, so they basically represent the transfer path from a sound source location to the ear canal entrance, and they include all the cues uh, such as interaural time difference, interaural level difference, the spectral cues, cues, and technically also the dynamic changes of each of these cues, because um, um, you can certainly include different head orientations um, in the definition of what is an HRTF, what is a head-related transfer function. <laughs>